So welcome everybody to um, our November Camino Wisdom Stories event. This is the first time that we have a special guest with us that we're interviewing. So the format's gonna be a little bit different. Um, so Adam and I are hosting, if you've not been with us before, say hello, Adam. Hello, everyone. Yes, hello. and BB is our, is our special guest today. BB, if you wanna say hi, you'll show up on people's screens. Hello, everyone. It's great to see you all. Um, gosh, we've so been looking forward to this. I can't even tell you. Um, I, I know we could talk to BB for days, but we're going to keep this within 90 minutes. Let me just go through a little bit of housekeeping and then we'll jump in. So um, the, the first, it's a 90 minute event and the first 45 to 60 minutes or so Adam, Bibi, and I are going to be having a conversation. At that time, if you'll mute yourselves, that would be great. Put questions in the chat if you want to. I love that you have your videos on because then we get to feel like we're all connected. We get to see you. For this time, we're a Camino community. Imagine us sitting us all at a pilgrim's table somewhere. Um, and then in the last we'll say 30 to 45 minutes, we're gonna open it up for um, everybody to participate where you get to ask your questions or have comments and things like that, that will be coming. We're gonna talk about three different areas when, when Adam and I speak with BB. We're gonna start out with like, what is the whole thing about the goose here? Then we're gonna talk about her journeys and we're gonna go into tips for our Caminos and our life. And um, then, like I said, we'll open it up to everybody. So um, take a moment and just, if you haven't already, like just look around this pilgrim community and see if there are familiar faces and who all is here. Um, just make a connection, put on your best smile. Mm -hmm. yeah. And um, we usually go around the room in, the, in our Camino Wisdom Story events. But if you'll just put your name in the, well, I guess your name will pop up, um, but if you'll just write in the chat where you're calling from, it's always fun to see that. And we want to ask you, um, we'll introduce Bibi formally in a moment, but if you could just raise your hand or your virtual hand, if you have walked the Camino, let's start there. Okay, a good number, but not everybody. So good to know. Um, and how many of you have already read Bibi's book that we're talking about today, The Way of the Wild Goose? A fair number as well. Oh, that's fantastic. Great. If not, um, we can't recommend it highly enough and hope that this will inspire you to get out and read it. And then um, the last, and then has anybody read any of her other books? Okay. Oh, you got some fans in the house, BB. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, let's let me introduce BB real quickly and then I'm going to hand it over to Adam. He usually has some kind of inspiring wisdom to share, and I'm sure he won't let us down today. So, BB, um, we're so happy to have you here with us today. BB is an award winning freelance travel writer. She's also an anthropologist and those two things coming together, I hope we hear a little bit about the magic of those two things and how they both come together into the gifts that, into the books that she's written. Um, she's written travel guides like the Camino, the moon guide on the Camino de Santiago. She's written books about um, sacred places in Spain. She um, has written about her time in France and on, archeological excavation sites and things like that. Um, she loves, and I love this about her, she loves food and wine, and that's a part of this travel guide that she's written here. She loves people, um, she connects so easily with people, um, and she loves culture, history, and there's just so much, so many levels in this book, so many layers, and we hope to uncover some of them with you. So welcome again, BB and Adam. I'm going to hand it over to you. Okay, thank you. So thank you. 
Thanks, thanks, Betty. Hi, everybody. Um, thanks for putting in where you're from in the chat box. I'll just share with you. I'm, I'm just calling from outside London in the UK. Um, and I thought I would start this with some BB, some very, might be very auspicious. I went for a walk just before it got dark here. And I thought I'd love to have a sign about tonight. And um, basically on my walk, just before I, I turned around and got back, um, I found the sign. It just, on this footpath, I look up and there we have the sign of a public footpath with sort of a goose or probably a swan, I don't know, <laughs> and, an, and an, this time an orange arrow. And I thought, how spooky is that? Maybe this is, we're all on the right place at the right time Let's for me it. tonight. So, <laughs> um, <laughs> so we're starting off with that. Um, so yes, Bibi, I, I absolutely loved reading your book and, um, and I really felt I was, was with you. And I, I, and I think that the title that you have for the book um, really does speak to, to lots of different themes. <laughs> the way of the wild goose, three pilgrimages following geese, stars, and hunches on the Camino de Santiago. And in short, it's, you know, I think in your words, you say it's a pilgrimage turned adventure story in pursuit of a pagan mystery on the Camino de Santiago across France and Spain. And so I thought maybe I'd like to start by just asking you, um, what what is the way of the goose? It, it just begin there, that first part of the title. Yeah, let's just dive right in that rabbit hole. Into it. <laughs> it is uh, what a what a wonderful sign you had because that right there is the way of the goose. Um, the signs just showing up when you ask for them. And uh, the, really, there's so many strands of the goose that kept coming at me from different sources and experiences that there are many things that come into explaining what is the way of the goose. But the first and foremost is when I started hearing more and more about goose symbolism on the Camino, I started paying attention to any time it showed up and noting it down. and. One of the things that I heard was that it is said in the Middle Ages when pilgrims were walking to Santiago that they would follow the Milky Way. So it's the path of the Milky Way, path of the stars. But they also sometimes in references in, in scholarly material talking about this following the Milky Way, they said pilgrims also referred to it as following the way of wild geese. And, you know, it really made me sit up and pay attention because you know we used the stars to navigate but that was by night and by day what did we use well one of the 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 guides that we had were geese because they were very regular in their traditional migratory routes and in their seasons and uh so so that that's where you know in the biggest swath of things that's how the camino and the way of the wild goose or the way of the goose is, is associated with the Camino as well as with the Milky Way. And then it starts, if you really start thinking about it, when, you know, in the Middle Ages, the vast majority of people, even people who lived in urban centers were still connected to nature and to natural rhythms. And they were aware of nature and natural rhythms to the point of, it, it was an intimate language. You know, and I talk about this in my book also about the language of the birds or the language of, of nature, the language of animals, we used to speak that language and we used to understand it. And this is a part of it too, of, of when you're navigating the world, especially before the industrial era, you're really paying attention to the signs all around you and of, of what nature is telling you every day. And so that's a big part of it too. And that is very much a pilgrim's way as well, because we, you know, what is the first thing that's heightened for us when we set off on the Camino de Santiago is start paying attention to the signs, you know, the most evident ones being those arrows, you know, that get us going sure. towards Santiago and, and the scallop shells. Um, but then other signs start appearing and that's, that's where it started getting more um, uh, 
interesting in a way um, of what, what this, this path can do on many levels. And I met many pilgrims who initiated me to the many other signs to look for. And I hear you say, you know, it makes us um, become more alert and it's, and it's sort of something like goosebumps. <laughs> is, it, is it that in that sense, you know, we, 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 we're more alive, we're more awakened. In such oh, time. Adam, absolutely. And I'm so glad you said that because not only like did you, you go and look for a sign for today and then you saw the, the public footpath with the, the symbol of this, the swan or the goose. And we can get into that later that goose, ducks and swans are all actually put in the same biological family of Anatidae. And they're the only three in that family. And so they're very similar. And, and yeah. they're, it, a swan showing up is as good as a goose sign as well as a duck. Oh, okay. And, um, but, but, but I feel like there should be a warning, like a, like a warning label on the book saying that once you start paying attention to the goose, you're going to find the goose everywhere. It's just gonna start <laughs> popping up. And it certainly happened to me and it keeps happening to me, so. I'm curious. You have a map of France behind you on on the wall. I see, and I and and you mentioned just now the language of birds, and yes. I've read somewhere, and I have actually written it down. So this is another coincidence <laughs> that in the in the Middle Ages, the la langue des oiseaux, the language of birds, was a slang language used by the troubadours, originating in the I'm going to say this wrong, Occitane. Or, or, or that region of France, I think. Um, and I'm just curious that, that you know, the, the, so much of the Camino came out, House, Clu House of Cluny, the stonemasons, all of, came out from that, that part of France and went into, into Spain. Um, if, if, we were, if we were medieval pilgrims today, uh, walking, down into that part of France, and we didn't know anything about the goose, would we have discovered that there? Would, would it become more, the, I'm just trying to find, would there be an awakening there on our walk as a medieval pilgrim? Yeah, you know, it get, it get, again, it goes back to this, this rich awareness pe people would have had in the Middle Ages and prior to the Middle Ages of mm. their environment and, and what's around them and listening to things, not just in nature and in human society. And the medieval world view also saw everything, everything visible represented something invisible. You know, so it was, there was more behind yeah. what you're seeing and hearing. And in, in the Long des Oiseaux is just, you know, it is, it is a part of that uh, deeper hearing, deeper vision, deeper perception, uh, and wider as well. And, um, and, and indeed, I mean, it, it was for, for the medieval stonemasons, they would have been deeply immersed in these traditions, um, as well as traditions of sacred geometry and um, the, the sacred systems and, and signs and symbols and associations and paying attention to, to nature and the signs yeah. from nature as well. I mean, none of the places that have chapels on them that were built in medieval Europe were built there by any accident. They were scouted carefully. And a lot of those places also preceded the Christian era and were sacred sites already, like a holy stream, a holy well, a holy cave. Yeah. And they were venerated by the local people. Uh, and I don't know if I'm answering your question. This is a very yeah, yeah, no, no, totally. It's just that I was just, <laughs> I was just curious that you know, was there a center of goose magic, so to speak, and it was in that part of France, or it was, but, but you know, it well, seems I think like you know, I think all all across Eurasia, we find this association with the goose, and mm. uh, with with the goose is a divine animal, and often a divine animal associated with a creator goddess or a mother goddess figure. Um, you know, in the in the classical era, we have the goose showing up a lot with Artemis and with Aphrodite, with Diana, um, Juno. Her 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 animal, her sacred animal, was the goose. And the most famous goose story from the Roman era is that really early Roman era was that um, a, a Gallic tribe was attack was attacking the 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 Capitoline the hill coming up the hill. And the guards, the Roman guards didn't pick them up, but it was near one of Juno's temples. 
and the geese raised the alarm at night and protected Rome. This was something like in 390 BC. And, uh, and the Romans after thereafter told this story many times about the sacred geese who protected their, their capital. Um, but we have stories all across Eurasia of goose magic. You know, we'll, you'll find it in, in, in Vedic stories in India. And I mean, we even get our, you know, El Ganso on the Camino, which is the gander, comes from Ansar and Ansar comes from Sanskrit, which means goose. <laughs> You know, and so we have goose magic all over the place. And one of the things I was really digging into is why, but then why did it concentrate so much on the roots of the Camino, especially in Southern France and Northern Spain? And there can be a lot of threads to answering that, but one okay. of the ones that I really latched onto is that we have this really ancient association with the goose is a divine animal in a lot of folkloric traditions. And in native pre-Christian Europe, there's a high concentration. I mean, one of the people who pointed out this goose association with goddesses was Jacob Grimm in his more scholarly works of, of the Teutonic mythology. And he said, I think that the goose-footed queen, La Reine Pédoc, which is uh, Occitan, from Southern France for the goose-footed queen is actually related to Bert, who is Berta, who is, or Percha, who is our Southern German goose-footed goddess, who is associated with this other waterfowl-footed goddess up further north. And I think they're all connected and they even might connect to the Lamia who we start finding in the Pyrenees and then all the way over to Galicia, who are these bird-footed uh, water women. They, they really were probably goddesses in their own rights, but the more and more of uh, the approach and, and, and rooting of Christianity, they became nature spirits, and then they became fairies. And, then, and, and this is another thing about the whole goose thing. Um, our mother goose also may come from this same ancestry. And when it was less and less safe to worship any other divinity than the one Abrahamic God, <laughs> you know, um, it was, you know, all these other divinities found different ways to, to hide. And it wasn't that they were, I mean, we can say they were trying to survive, but really the people who worshiped them were trying to keep them yeah. and help them survive because yeah. Even if you are going to church, let's say you you know it's the 1100s and you're going to church, and you've become a Christian and you're baptized, but you're living in the countryside and all your prior generations have been growing food and tilling the soil and tending to the forest and foraging and hunting, and gathering. You're still going. You're still inheriting this vast sacred system that sees nature as very alive and holy and you're making offerings. You don't wanna take any chances on the health of your cattle or your, your, your garden uh, without you know, making an offering. So people would still quietly go make offerings to you know, that holy well. And, you know, and, and that's where maybe the Lamia existed uh, or, and she's known with many other names. Um, these, these women associated with animals and oftentimes with bird feet. And they're all over, especially across Southern France and in, in Northern Spain. And over time, they start putting uh, idols of Mary at that well or that stream, you know, but it's still that tradition. Um, so again, I've gone off on a long tangent. <laughs> no, it's very, inter it's very, okay, it's very interesting, but it shows that it's something very ancient, very, very old. Um, in the continuation of it, and maybe it's been yeah. in the Mother Mary and what we see, all the churches of Santa Maria on the Camino. Um, I want to do, I want to ask you, you know, the goose game itself, you know, when we're in, you know, I think you say, I, in, in your book, you say, I froze in place midway across the plaza, realizing that this whole goose business was real, real enough that the city had directed funds to build this metaphoric monument to the pilgrim's spiritual journey. Um, was that where you had your first call to the goose, so to speak? I just want to share a, um, a photo of that. It's, uh, <laughs> um, 
Thank you for bringing that up. And I know you have a deep association with Lebrano, so you know this, this board game that's inlaid in the square in uh, Logroño, but it was, um, the screen, right? so, yeah, yeah, there it is. There it is. It's right on the Camino as you go through Logroño and it's right in the square of the San, Plaza de Santiago, right next to the Iglesia de Santiago. Um, it's also, it's just more popularly called the Plaza del Juego de la Oca, the, the square of the game of the goose. And inlaid in it is this massive, uh, children's board game called the Game of the Goose that goes back many centuries, maybe more than many centuries. People really don't know its origins, but it's it's uh, this game of chance that you play. You roll dice. You have sixty three squares uh, on that kind of that larger square that can be in the shape of a labyrinth, like a spiral or a zigzagging back and forth. A lot like snakes and ladders. You throw dice. You move your piece. You fall on lucky squares, which are marked by geese like that one you see right there, there you go. Thank you, perfect. There's a classic game of the goose. And this one is, 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 is uh, mapping the Camino de Santiago. Uh, and so what, well, the, the first time I started hearing about geese was not this goose game. It was from European pilgrims, especially from Spain and France who would you would in conversation it would come up they'd say oh I'm, I'm i'm on this initiatory journey and i'm following the signs and i was like what signs you know i mean there's arrows there's scallop shells and they're like oh you know it's an initiatory journey so i can't tell you too much but one of the signs is the footprint of the goose and i was just thinking okay i didn't see that coming <laughs> you know <laughs> and but it kept coming up and then i started finding that there is in French and in Spanish literature about this sign of the goose. And it goes back, you know, some like, uh, uh, what is his first name? Charpentier, is it Louis? He wrote something about, the, uh, he's written several books. D does anyone know who I'm talking about? He, he, he wrote a book about the Camino de Santiago, specifically about the goose footprint and how it was a sign of the stonemasons. This was the, their, their sign that they could identify each other and know that they were initiated to a deeper uh, tradition. And then I found it, similar literature in Spanish. And so this was all swirling around and I was going, wow, this is interesting, but it still, it doesn't make sense to me how the goose becomes equated with the medieval Camino or, or a sacred spiritual initiatory path. And but it was that moment when I walked into Logroño and I stopped at that square and looked down and the square has places of the Camino in it, you know, so, so certain, you know, it's 63 squares again. I actually hear, I have a drawing of that same square so you can see the whole thing um, for like a bird's eye view. It's 63 squares in Logroño. It's, you enter here and you walk across nine squares. You go up to second level. You walk nine squares. You go up. So it's nine, nine squares on a stack of, of, of seven, seven rows. 63, nine times 60, nine times seven. And every five, four squares is a goose. So here you have a goose. You enter, here's a goose, here's a goose, here's a goose, here's a goose. And you can land on certain places in all these places that you land on that represent certain things that you, like it can be a lucky square or an unlucky square, an ordeal or a gift, you can think of it, are places on the Camino. So you have Sirauki, you have Estella, you have Navarrete, you have Leon. And of course the ultimate square is Santiago de Compostela where you have St. James shown with a goose. <laughs> So I was just thinking, okay, the Camino, the game of the goose, the goose, this is a thing. This is a real thing. I'm not imagining this anymore. And, and then I started paying much more attention. Um, yeah, so I, I actually, you know, I've been on the Camino many times, but I, when that happened, I just sort of made a mental note the the next few times you're on the Camino, pay attention to this goose business. You know, and yeah, and many years later, the, the way of the wild goose 
Here okay. we are. <laughs> yeah, because that um, that particular drawing is the ascendance, ascendancy one, isn't it, of, of the goose game in Lagrano? It is. And each each nine is yeah. the, the the numbers symbolise transformation each level or something. So Thank that's you. spiritual transformation. Um, and I think I should probably leave it here. BB, we can come back to that. We could talk that, that forever. And I and I know <laughs> Kathy has something to say as well. So it's uh, but, but thank you so much for, for that. Absolutely wonderful. Likewise. <laughs> <laughs> BB, that's so fascinating. The I can't imagine. I I'm I'm so curious. I'm totally off script right now. But as you're talking, it. <laughs> I can't imagine what that was like on your Caminos, on these three pilgrimages, to just keep seeing more and more and more and different connections and different layers of it. Um, I just, what was that like? If you can speak to just a little bit about that, like what was, can you even give a story of some time when something new was revealed to you and what that feels like on that, on that quest? Absolutely. You know, what comes to mind right away is the first pilgrimage I, I, I can't recount in, in the way of the wild goose is a pilgrimage in France. It's on the Arles route, that southernmost main route um, in, in southern France. It traditionally can start in Arles and makes its way through Toulouse and uh, toward the Pyrenees via uh, Oleron Sainte Marie, a little further east of Saint Jean Pied de Port. They're both kind of the staging towns for crossing the Pyrenees. And I was doing it with uh, a friend from Colorado who also is a Camino, lover of the Camino. And she had this mission to walk a route backwards and invited me, said, let's walk the Arles route, let's walk it backwards. And oh, by the way, instead of starting in Oloron Saint Marie, let's start in Saint Jean Pied de Port, take a bridging route to Oloron Saint Marie, which is a four day trek, the, the Voie de Piedmont. And then work our way towards Toulouse. And I was thinking, I'm all in, <laughs> let's do this. This is great, walk in reverse. We both walked the Camino, you know, in the, the normal direction, you know, going to the West. And, and I was at this point really deep immersed in the literature and lore and folklore and archeology span of all these goose appearances, the goose symbolism and goose stories and, goose folklore and and I was just thinking you know I'd had made this map of, of France and Spain and I'd hand drawn it and I was writing in all these places where I'd find geese ducks and swans or any kind of association with uh, uh, there are actually places there are churches in France they no longer survive but there were engravings of women with one foot that was a goose or a duck foot or swan foot you know, and I was just marking all these things on the map, just thinking, and really high concentration of them. It was really central goose territory that she was proposing we walk through on the Arles route. So I was thinking, I'm going to look for all these geese, you know, and I was so immersed in the stories of these bird footed women. Um, that that's kind of what I was looking for. And I was talking to locals. I was like, so do you still tell stories about these, you know, <laughs> the La Reine Pédoc or these goose footed women? And and, and I mean, if that, there were really interesting conversations that came out of that question, but nothing, everyone was like, well, I mean, sure, it's a children's, you know, story or this and that or something from our past. But then uh, we were, and my friend, my, my friend was really aware of how I wanted to find signs of the goose or find, and by then I knew that ducks and swans are also equivalent, you know, so the Anatidae family, find their signs. And we were um, walking, we'd walked for many days and we walked into the village of Morlas, M-O-R-L-A-A-S, Morlas. And she was a little further ahead of me. And when I walked in and I was, you always, as you know, as pilgrims, you make your way first towards the church or the path goes past the church before it goes past, you know, your, your pilgrim lodging for the night. <laughs> And she just turned and came back and she said, I think you just won the goose lottery. <laughs> and I was like, what is she talking about, you know? <laughs> and um, sure enough, as soon as I stood in front of the west entrance of the, uh, the Eglise de Saint-Foy, de devoted to Saint Faith, Saint-Foy, 
um, in, in this, this village, beautiful Romanesque church with the classic Romanesque, you know, half moon shape. I just was flabbergasted because there Adam is showing, it's, it's actually in the design of my book is the, the art director of, at, at Monkfish uh, Book Publishing, just, he loved that arch and he was like, that needs to be in there and in closing this more modern rendering of the game of the goose below it. So there were 26 ducks on this arch. I think it's the fifth arch uh, up from in the doorway. Wow. And there's 13 ducks going in one direction and 13 ducks going in the other direction and the two at the top of the arch kiss. Oh. So, well, there are 13 geese in the game of the goose. Yeah. So we, th there's 13 and 13 and it's just like, so we have two game of the geese going on or do we have one troop of pilgrims going to Santiago and coming back or do we have the meeting the two troops of pilgrims what's going on here and I dug so that was just a that was an explosive aha and I'm this is some this is really something going on here and I I just there was no turning back after that that was probably the most you know even more profound than the game of the goose in Logroño because that I mean that's pretty cool but that game of the goose plaza was inlaid in stone you know it's like marble and granite or something isn't it Adam yeah and I think it, so it's, yeah. it's just the human scale game of the goose in Logroño that's pretty phenomenal but that's a modern creation you know it was a square that they they were trying to figure out how to restore and renovate this part of Logroño and they came up with all kinds of ideas and what won out was this inlaid board game that you know I'm going to come back now I'm going to go back to that game of the goose and, and what Adam was talking about earlier because that design is a parish priest in, in Logroño Ojeda who sadly died in 2016 because it would have been great to meet him and he built into that design a lot of esotericism. I mean, he basically said the Camino is a spiritual path and the game of the goose is a spiritual path and both of them are metaphors and guides for the spiritual path that we are on, which is our lives. And, and in it, he put in um, Kabbalah and um, Tarot and uh, all kinds of sacred geometry and numerology and the chakras, you know, and it was just mind blowing. Anyway, we can go back to that. But so it's a pretty phenomenal thing, that square, but it's still, it was created, I think it, they started building it in 2004 or inaugurated it in, around 2004. But this archway in more or less was from the 12th century. So it's taking the, all this imagery way back and to encounter it so boldly and it gave a lot more weight to the idea of pilgrims following the path of migratory waterfowl you know as a part of their signs and guides and and direction but also the idea that the the goose is a, a lucky animal it, it is it is a guardian and a guide and it is a lucky animal in many traditions and including european traditions uh, and people in wales use used to use geese as, as guard dogs, you know, instead of dogs, you know, there would be a goose under the, the stairs, you know, <laughs> alerting them to anyone coming. Uh, so all kinds of things. And, and that just made me really pay attention. It was, it was pretty exciting. And then I dug into, well, what are, what are the art historians or the church, you know, what are the church documents? What are they saying about what do these 26 ducks represent? And I found a 19th century account from another parish priest from the village near Morlas, who was himself intrigued by the symbolism of the ducks and knew it was something uh, special. And he, he basically said, I think these are pilgrims to Santiago de Compostela and they behave a lot like the migratory ducks and geese that we see crossing through our town all the time. You know, they're, it's not just that they're migratory and they're going in one direction or another, but they band together, they look after each other, they take care of each other. They also get involved in all kinds of intrigue and social politics with each other. If you spend time watching geese and ducks, you'll see exactly what I'm talking about, wow. <laughs> you know, the pond politics. 
Uh, and he said they're, they're a perfect representation of pilgrims. <laughs> oh my gosh, this is so fascinating to hear like the inner workings of the, the, how you discovered this and how much fun that must have been. Bibi, I'm, I'm glad that you brought up all the different layers that the, there's this goose game thing. There's the pilgrimage, which is a spiritual journey. And you're doing, you're doing your research on the Camino and collecting all of this information and, and digging deeper, visiting places. You're also having your own Camino, which in the pilgrimage, and you're very, I loved this about your book. You're really vulnerable about, especially on that second Camino in the book, about um, stepping more fully into your writing and your vocation. So I'm curious if you could tell us um, and this will be my last question before we go into some tips from you, but what can you say about how did you do all of that? I can't even imagine what that was like to have all of that at once. It seems like one multiple year long Camino with so many different levels to it. How did you write the book? That's way too much for you to answer, but it, what do you want to touch on there? I'll jump in. Um, I, I think that, you know, for first of all, you know, I, I first stepped on the Camino in 1995. I didn't walk the whole thing or what we think of the Camino as the Camino Frances. I, I walked a portion of it in Galicia and a tributary. Um, and then it was 1997 where I started meeting pilgrims. I went back and I started hearing about the goose and, and the sign. And I lived on the Camino in different parts of it. Um, and both of the Camino Frances and the Camino del Norte. And then I spent a lot of time in Southwestern France. So by the time I was um, focusing on a pilgrimage devoted to following the signs of the goose, it was many years down the, down, you know, after all this exposure and, and immersion. And that really helped a lot, you know, instead of, you know, setting foot for the first or second time on the Camino. So I had all of that backing me, you know, but I was also, I was also to, to go into the, the, the personal, you know, I, it was such an intellectual pursuit and I knew what the Camino can do to you because by, mm -hmm. by the time I was devoted to following the signs of the goose, I had already walked a full through trek on the Camino Frances. And I knew how it, just like, you know, Rumi speaks about the chickpea, you know, how it can boil you and season you. <laughs> and you're just like, what? You know, I don't want to be boiled anymore. You know? <laughs> but then you find out how good you taste, right? You know, it's so um, metaphorically. <laughs> and, yeah. and so so I really knew how, how, what the Camino can do to you personally, but still on this goose quest, and on you know my own vocation and what I was doing as as going towards what really mattered to me, uh, it was still approaching it very much like an intellectual thing, mm -hmm. and um, almost being resistant to anything uh, non-intellectual, non-rational, or or yeah, and uh, but just by and this is the thing that it. It's, I understand now those pilgrims who spoke about being initiated and following the signs of the goose, just by going back to the Camino the first time, then the second time, then the third time on the goose quest, just following the signs of the goose. I found myself being initiated. It just started happening. And that was, uh, not only, I mean, absolutely unexpected, but that really s drove home for me the power of pilgrimage and of this process that we all submit ourselves to when we pick up the pilgrim staff and cape and start walking in an act of faith and into the unknown. And it helped also really give me more confidence in your path is as a writer. That's the only path that's ever made sense. And it's the only path that keeps, you know, just infusing me with energy. And, you know, despite the ordeals, yeah. <laughs> the gifts are so much better. Just like the, the game of the goose, the ordeals and gifts, or the Camino, the ordeals and the gifts. Yeah. 
So that's a great answer. Thank you so much. Adam, can I ask one more thing before we move into the sure. next section? I, mean, I, I maybe you can. I, I just maybe can I just say something? Of course. <laughs> no, no. It's just that I just love in your book that re a really profound extract that I've taken out and I just thought what you just said there and it just it's that you know you, in the book I've written down in the book you quote a filmmaker Berin Stenas and I don't know if I said it right <laughs> so, that sounds um, good to me <laughs> okay and, and you say so I'm quoting I think I'm quoting you exactly here, and you say that pilgrimage stimulates the natural process and this is what he said you're saying what he said um, and you say that pig pilgrimage states stimulates the natural process of burning off the accumulated detritus of our lives and our egos. Arriving in Santiago de Compostela, and later on at the ocean, offers a process to strip away the impurities and reveal the true numinous being underneath, the soul shining with the brilliance of gold. It is the same alchemy implied in the game of the goose. The spiritual seeker takes up the journey and handles ordeals and receives gifts while shedding unnecessary baggage and lightening up. The ultimate and final test, the real alchemy, takes place on the death square with the full and final release of base metal, base ego, towards becoming fully reborn, transformed, iron to gold, goose to swan, mortal ego to eternal spirit. I just think that's so beautiful. <laughs> and, and it speaks to, you know, each of our own transformations that we go through probably multiple times in our life. So thank you for that. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Back to you, Kathy. <laughs> oh, I was similarly, I was just going to quote Bernadette, who, um, BB, I read another one of your books, Cafe Oak, which I loved. And I've told you personally how much I loved it and how much it moved me. And I've grown to love your friend Bernadette. And she says, um, she said to you at one point in the book, this is the great transformation I see for you on this Shema, pardon my French. Never before have you been so ready to die to your old self and to be reborn to who and what awaits you in the second half of your life. And maybe I'm curious at the time, what do you think she saw in you? And, and what do you think she meant by that? I think she saw a lot of things I didn't see myself that was right in front of my face, you know, but she's, um, I mean, she's, she just turned 89. Um, she's this, amazing. You know, she, and she's, for those of you who haven't read the book yet, she's, she's kind of like the wise woman that you meet at the fork of the road, you know, and she keeps weaving in and out of the story because each, each pilgrimage, I tried to start it in Sarlat in southwestern France, um, or certainly end it there and just touch in with with Bernadette. And um, you know, so she's she's 89 and she, you know, and my mom, by the way, is here, who's Nahid. Hi mom. She's, you know, a, a soul sister to Bernadette. They've never met, but they love each other and they they commune with each other and they see very much in similar ways. So my mom can probably answer this question too. Uh, that she just she had been there, you know. She knew what it meant to pass that that the the threshold into the second half of life, and she was, uh, you know, three decades down the road, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. of that journey, and knew how it can unfold and knew the gifts of it, and she knew what you have to let go of too. And, and so it was just a really magnificent thing that she spoke up and said, because she could see, I was just, you know, like somebody walking into the fog, you know, I, we, 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 we think we're ready for, for that transition. And then we get there and we're just like, what, <laughs> you know, I'm not immortal, what? Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> And then more things, you know, just start tumbling down. But she wanted me to know as things start tumbling down, things also start rising up. Oh, beautiful. Yeah. You want to add anything, Mom? <laughs> yeah, that's lovely. Maybe she'll speak up later, too. I would love to hear that from her. As I would really love to hear that from her. And you know, I'm, I'm Bernadette. Bernadette is the one who drew my attention to 
Vern Steinus's alchemy. He's mm -hmm. a Belgian alchemist uh, and he's a blacksmith too, you know, and he, he, he has this whole series on YouTube that was aired across Europe, you know, and then now it's on YouTube. And, and she basically said, you need to, to watch the alchemical journey. You need to watch this, especially, I think it was part five, which is he traces the Camino de Santiago from Paris through Chartres and then all the way to Finisterre in Northwestern Spain. And, and she's the one who woke me up to alchemy and, and that it's, you know, it's, it's both the material alchemy and it's also the spiritual alchemy. Yeah, that's what I mean, Bibi. This book is so rich. I could read it. I'm reading it again for the second time and I'm getting so much more even out of it the second time. Um, and thank you for all that. Like you've tackled something immense <laughs> and massive and we're so grateful. Let's move into some of the tips that you have. Adam, do you want to start in that section or shall I? Oh, no, I, I can say something. Um, yeah. So yeah, I mean, I think like, as you said, you know, that really when we walk the Camino, it's an awakening, the wild goose journey, it's, it's an awakening. Um, and often the, the challenge is when we get back to the ordinary world, so to speak, how do we, how do we stay connected to, to, to this wild goose journey um, or, or the Camino spirit or, you know, um, so I'm just curious, you know, if, if if wild geese have that magnetic, they 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 follow Earth's magnetic field, I guess, on their migrations. So how do we? What's our equipment? What would you know? In in your book, you speak to some incredible serendipities, but is there so much more? That's my question. Well, isn't I think one of the biggest gifts of the Camino is that it tunes you into your deeper sensory system. Or it reconnects you to it. Um, and it kind of goes back to that, that, you know, what I was saying about people in the Middle Ages, they, they lived much more in, in nature, they had to, and so they were much more aware of, of the nuances of nature. And um, as modern pilgrims, when we walk the Camino, and we, we get back to some of that, that awareness, and that paying attention partly because we have to, and partly because we have pared down what we need to just very few basic things that we carry in our backpack. And after, you know, at least, you know, for, it takes everyone a different amount of time, but usually after the first four or five days, you start realizing, I really don't need all this stuff, you know? And, and that's why in Navarra, the albergues have more stuff in their, you know, leave, leave behind boxes <laughs> than any other <laughs> province, because everyone just starts shedding their baggage, you know, they're, they're quite physical, literal baggage and um, simplifying life. And just getting into this, this walking, eating, sleeping, washing out, you know, your clothes by hand, hanging them to dry, you know, and then repeating the sec next day. And I think that that it's as a part of the burning off the, the base metals, you know, it's a part of, you know, just, just really um, doing away with, with stuff first at a physical level, and then all those long days of walking in that simplicity, we start uh, then stuff that we've never taken time to really look at starts coming up to the surface. It just starts rising, you know, and it can be all kinds of stuff. You know, everyone who's done just even one day of long walking knows all the thoughts that rise to the surface. And some of them are just unfinished business and things that, uh, I wish that hadn't happened, or I wish I hadn't handled it that way, or just things that we haven't fully processed or healed from, or as well as things that we just go, wow, that was so wonderful. And I'm so lucky I knew that person and all this rises up. And then it comes up in our dreams too. I don't know anyone who hasn't had their dreams altered also by the Camino. And so it's like this processing is constantly happening. And, and in this, this sort of cleansing and simplifying and, and processing and our, our senses expand because we start really learning to pay attention to sunrise and sunset and the moods of the day and looking for the arrows and suddenly finding ourselves in this new landscape, but, but communing with it at a level that we hadn't for a long time, uh, maybe since childhood when we used to just be outside and playing and suddenly just fusing with the environment and, and the elements around us. 
And I think then the synchronicities start, you know, sometimes the synchronicities happen from the moment you say, I'm gonna walk the Camino, but they seem to increase the more and more we, you, you kind of get into this daily rhythm and opening up your perceptions. And that is just such a powerful, all that package of everything I've mentioned is such a powerful thing to bring back home. And especially like the most one that I, I, I think I can just really uh, concretely remind myself to, to keep practicing every day. If I can't remember the simplicity or the, you know, is, is keep your perception open because there are more doors open here than you're aware of. And it, it happens on the Camino because we're so open but it's happening right here and now too, if we held that open perception, that wider gaze. And I think that's something, the, the way of the wild goose, that the Camino taught me I can trust all this stuff. It's very real. It just, it seems to happen just, you know, like clockwork, it's, as soon as you tap into it, it's just, it happens. And so that should happen at home too. And it does, it does. I have to remind myself more of it though, because I'm not surrounded by a bunch of pilgrims reminding me of it. <laughs> well, I like the, the, your distinction, I think you say at the end of the book, um, about goose vision versus arrow vision and having that as a, an awareness, I think, that actually am I in my goose vision or am I in my arrow vision, which speaks to, is it the linear, the linear path as opposed to an alternative, deeper, richer path? Yeah. I, I really, I'm not, I'm going to show you something and I'm not going to tell the story of it yet. Maybe I'll tell it later, but um, do you see these? <laughs> yes. Do you see these goose foot feet? They're, they're made of iron and I can tell you later about where they come from. But if, you know, we often follow the arrows on the Camino. And if you invert the arrow, you get the goose footprint. Wow. And, oh. and this is like, you know, all along, you know, arrow vision was telling me this is surface vision. And if you invert it, you get below the surface vision, oh. you know, or goose vision or arrow vision. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I but it do took hope. me three pilgrimages in many years to work that one out. <laughs> <laughs> and we get it in your book. I love that, BB. And I, I do hope you tell us that story later. I hope that we get that. The seeing beneath the surface, that seems you talk a lot about your dreams, paying attention to the dream. There's a lot of dreams that you share with us in this book. And I imagine that intuition is in there. You talk about following hunches. It's all of that invisible stuff. And it sounds like that's kind of what you meant when you were talking about the goose language earlier. Is that accurate? It's absolutely accurate. And um, dreams are <clears throat> dreams are a huge part of, of, you know, how to carry it over back to, you know, life here or home, mm -hmm. home life. I, I always have a notebook by my bedside and I just have the intention that I'm going to listen to my dreams and write them down. Because, you know, the beauty of that is no matter what's going on in your life, if you just watch, pay attention to your dreams, they're you getting out of your way, telling you stuff. <laughs> you know, so there's just this wonderful, honest dialogue and sometimes really profound and, and magnificent, the stuff that can come up. Um, but definitely the, the Camino, I, I, when my dreams just started intensifying by walking the Camino, um, I, I had already been writing my dreams down, but I made sure that I, I noted them down because I felt that they were as important as what was going on in my waking pilgrimage. And then when locals were telling me, there were a couple of times um, the locals said, I'm giving you this bed in the alberga and just know your head is laying on the Camino when you go to sleep tonight. And that's going to do things to your dreams or you know, see what you think of when you wake up. And it, 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 it's just a wonderful reality when that's all just normal conversation. Yeah. Um, but it was really interesting that, you know, locals, you know, speak about this energy, this, this ley line energy of the Camino and that it alters our consciousness in a, in a, in a growthful way. Mm. Even if sometimes, you know, we're feeling like really resistant or grouchy stuff is coming up. That's a part of the alchemical process. 
Yeah. Wow. Thank you for all of that. Thank you. Let's open this up to our bigger audience right now. And I know Adam and I still have more questions, which if there aren't any there, we'll come back to. But yeah, let's open it up and let's start with any questions or comments that you have for BB. Um, let me put myself on gallery view. There we go. Either raise your real hand, your virtual hand. Um, who? What, does anybody have anything to comment or question about? Esther. BB, it's just lovely, lovely, lovely to see you. You too, have, Esther. I have uh, mm -hmm. two questions and you can choose to answer both or neither. And they're both big questions. <laughs> <clears throat> One is, have you made the connection between the goose story and the sweet swan of Avon? No. You know who I mean? No. Uh, uh, so the sweet swan of Avon is uh, named William Shakespeare. And um, oh, yes. And um, it really big. And I also just have to say parenthetically that I don't think a man named William wrote the Shakespeare material. I, I think a far more um, massive and refined mind was behind it. But um, that leads into like all of, <laughs> all of uh, British, I mean, a great deal of British literature and all the symbolism in that stuff. So, um, uh, that might be something to explore. And I'd love to talk with you about that sometime. The other question I have is, you are masterful about gathering tidbits of information. And what I'm really curious about is how do you do note taking and research as you're doing all this walking and thinking and talking and interacting and I mean, do you just sleep four hours a night or what? Is, how do you do this? I think Sometimes. it's so amazing. <laughs> oh, thank you, Esther, for all that. Um, and this, you know, your, your second question comes back to Kathy's question about the writing and the anthropology coming together. And uh, it, it's a lot of note taking um, because, you know, I'm, I'm really so grateful for my training in anthropology because it really trains you for uh, doing good solid research in the field you know while you know dealing with all sorts of things um, and and so when I was in, in doing my doctorate at Penn in anthropology one of my advisors said you know let's talk about the field journals and the all this information and you know, uh, there's already a journal going on for just the the source material that's not talking to people. You know, the archival stuff and the book stuff. That's another. That's one notebook. So then it's just uh, he said, you know, when you're in the field, you want to keep. You really want to keep two field notes journals. You want the official one where you're you're going to be. Um, that's the one that 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 will contain you know all the official interviews and conversations and observations then you want to have a private one where you let off all your steam <laughs> or you speak your private thoughts and he's like and you need both because you're learning a culture you're immersing in a culture you're having these experiences and both are very important but they should be kept separate and both will inform you but one will remind you of you're just an ego-bound person dealing with all this stuff and the other one will be the 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 the, the formal lens of the the participant observer <laughs> in the context and then i went to a conference so i do that i do that uh and then i went to an anthropology conference and one of the panels was actually about how when you're immersing yourself in a culture that is not your birth culture and you're really learning it and you're learning the language and you're talking to people you should also keep a dream journal that comes back to the dream journal as well, because your dreams are telling you as much about what you're learning in that culture, but at a level that you're not necessarily immediately aware of. It's your subconscious 
speaking to you about how you're, you're, you're adapting and acclimating. When I now do research, um, whether it's in Southwestern France or for a, a, a commission project um, from a, a, a publisher or a travel publication like a magazine um, or like my guidebook or, or any a new book that I wanna do on the Camino, I now, um, because now I have the gift of an iPhone, which I really don't like using when I, I don't really like technology when I'm walking on the Camino, but I love the notes feature <laughs> where you just put the little microphone on and dictate and it's starting to understand when I say descend, I mean descend physically, I don't mean descent because the, for some reason, the, the dictation programming in our iPhones are more geared towards social and political conversation than natural and trekking conversation. <laughs> but it's getting to know my voice. So, so I just dictate. As I'm walking, I'll dictate something I see or an insight I have or an idea I have, and I'll sort it out later in the evening. I also have a traditional journalist's flip top notebook in my, my pocket with a pen that I will pull out and jot things down um, because you don't always want to pull out your iPhone and dictate stuff. Um, and then I'll stop and I'll, I'll, I have another notebook. It's the same size as the journalist flip top one, little, you know, what are they, three by five, that I just write the notes of the day freehand. I put my dreams in there too. I don't worry about, you know, them being separate or not. And then I take tons of photos thanks to digital photography, that's now a great way to take notes and to capture, remember something, the colors, the textures, even the smells, you know, I've been, I've taken photos of, you know, steam coming off of a <laughs> tortilla, you know, what I mean? anything to remind me of that day for details. Uh, and then um, I, I just do my best to, to, to feel like I've, caught up on all my notes and I understand them, even if I can't completely put them in the order I want them every day, that, that, that I can catch up to that later. And then there are many times, especially like when researching the guidebook, the Camino de Santiago guidebook, but sometimes other research as well, especially on the Camino, where I just you know don't stay in an albergue that night because I'm so behind my work. <laughs> you know, and I know I want to get caught up in all the conversations and I don't want to tell people you can't talk to me. I'm writing right now, you know, it's just, just so antisocial and in Alberta. So I just find myself a private room and um, and there's a one case in the book that I recount where I, I was working so hard that I fell asleep on my notes and, you know, woke up with the crease in my face and, and I was also having a, a bad dream. So it was just, you know. <laughs> But those days are very rare, you know, it's just, I actually love all of these, you know, it's like you're, you're pulling out all these, like, you have this fully loaded, you know, gun, guns, you know, you're pulling out one notebook and another, and then, you know, <laughs> the phone, the camera, without being too obnoxious, you know, it's, it is a pilgrimage. <laughs> Collectively, that must weigh about six pounds. Yeah. Oh, and there's one more piece um, is I just saw my mom. There she is in, in her wonderful square. Um, I, I now like to, to shoot an email every day to both my husband and my mom, just so, to, to, to be in touch with them and, and let them know. So I'll, I'll compose an email. Sometimes it comes from what I dictated. You know, sometimes they get too much information, but so far no one's complained. So there we go. Yeah, it doesn't weigh too much. It doesn't weigh too much, but I, you know, I, I sacrifice something else that, that I won't take, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we have another question or comment from Harriet. Harriet, you're um, muted. Hi, Harriet. <laughs> okay. Um, thank you so much. Um, so I had three little comments. Um, one was about your initial, uh, idea of, you know, reading it, I read, you know, when I read your book, um, uh, my mother passed away 35 years ago, and she had one, you know, she had taken some craft class or something, and she had had one big embroidery piece that she had made, and it's of geese. Um, <laughs> and, uh, you know, I never 
I, I guess I never really looked at it before, but all of a sudden I realized, wow, you know, when I put up my wall of Camino stuff, if I ever do it, um, that should go with it, with the goose. Oh, that's beautiful. And uh, because when I walked the Camino, I never saw a goose, never saw, you know, in my brain, I never saw a goose. So next I'll have to go back to find the geese. And um, the, the, the second thing I thought about is that um, I'm involved with my American Pilgrims uh, chapter. And it, I was seeing it'd be a great activity uh, to, uh, you know, you could, there's a place on the internet where you can just print off the, the board game. It's maybe eight and a half by 11 um, uh, of the, the, the game of the goose. And you can, um, you know, like maybe we could have an activity where we all play it, you know, just so people could be exposed to it. Harriet, I think that's a great idea. And I, I it's, if people play it, they realize it's actually a hard game. It's, it's hard in the same way the Camino is. <laughs> You know, only it's not physically, you know, demanding, but it's a really hard game to actually to get to Santiago. <laughs> you really have to work at it um, because you, you land on a square. I mean, there is a here. I'm just going to grab this. There's square 58, right? Yeah, square 58 on the board game. You see how, how you're almost in Santiago. It's the death square. And if you land on that, you have to go all the way back to the beginning. And right before it, square 52 is the prison square. And you have to sit there until somebody lands on it and releases you. And then they're in prison. You know, and then you finally get close to square 63 and you're like, I'm almost winning. I'm almost home. I'm almost in Santiago de Compostela. You have to roll exactly the right number of dice on the dice to land on 63. If you don't, if you rent, roll more, you have to go backwards the, to fulfill the full throw of, on the dice, number on the dice. And if you land on a goose this time, normally going forward, the goose will send you forward the same number you rolled. But now if you land on a goose, it'll send you backwards the same. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and so pilgrims can identify with this. This is like the blisters. This is like the tendonitis. This is like no bed at the inn. <laughs> You know, this is like, I need a rest day. <laughs> Great for uh, getting uh, stories, uh, people to tell their stories. Yeah. I had just one more thing. Can you um, give me the name again of that person on YouTube who does the alchemist um, or with the program? Yeah, it, it's Bernsteinus. I have it in the book. And Adam, it's, would, it, Adam, I think, has it written down. Would you put that in the chat, Adam? Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Great. So. If you could put the name of his... Um, YouTube series yeah, or a program. Yeah, yeah, I saved the link the other day. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, Harriet. And Susan, I see you've raised your hand. Yes. Hi, um, I'm Susan. And um, I had the privilege of, of walking um, from Logroño on a 10 day with Kathy and Adam and Martin. And it was my third time on the Camino and I had never seen the goose. I walked past that, that plaza. This was the third time and I didn't know what I was looking at, obviously the first two. And it's just amazing how blindly we can walk through life without understanding what it is that we're looking at, you know? And so that was a real aha for me on that wonderful 10 day tour that they that they gave. Um, and my question to you is much more practical. Um, um, the, you've done a lot of walking in France um, and I've tried to, I've started to branch out away from Spain. I've done some Portuguese and some Italian uh, walk with the Via Francigena. And um, Fran France is next on my radar. And um, which of the four have you walked the four and which which do you suggest is was the best experience for you i've walked portions of all four i've walked most on the the arl route and the via podiensis the the lapui route mm -hmm. so the two southernmost yes and i mean if you've done the via francigena you're probably already you know ready for the, the, the French routes, which are, you know, they don't have quite as much in between stopping places. So that, that sort of, you know, there's not as many albergues or, or cafes 
and you some days, many days, especially on the Le Puy route, you have to walk further than you know most people like to. You know, it's more than twenty five kilometers. Mm -hmm. But as far as I, I mean, there's still a way to you know work that out because you can still instead of staying in a in a pilgrim's jeet, it's like the albergue, you just you know can find a private inn mm -hmm. in a in between place. Um, but as far as which one I prefer the most, I love them all. Um, I think they're all really interesting. For which many, one the the, which one is the easiest and has has the most infrastructure? Mm. Mm. Probably, I would say probably the Le Puy route, just because it's the most walked. Okay. But especially by French walkers who may not see themselves, a lot of them don't see themselves as pilgrims. They just see themselves as, you know, hikers and they like to go for, you know, a good holiday, you know, mm -hmm. walk for five to 10 days or something like that. Mm -hmm. it ten, but it has tends to have the most infrastructure just for being the most popular. Um, and you can also like a lot of them as they get closer to Saint-Jean-Pied-de-Port have more support. Mm -hmm. So you can also think about, well, I mean, if you want to do the whole thing in one go, that's great. But if you don't, you know, you can say, well, maybe I'll, you know, do it in portions and, and maybe you can do, I, I really wouldn't know which one to recommend more, but I would say the Le Puy is, is all right. It's my favorite. <laughs> <laughs> and is the, is the Argyle less, less, uh, uh, um, less topography, less, less up and down? The Arl route, um, yeah. it uh, depends on where you start. Um, I don't know too much of the topography from Arl to Carcassonne, but I think you're going to be crossing some some serious hill country. Um, but once you're you're from Toulouse. Let's see, where do they, the foothills really start picking up. I have to think, because I walked it in reverse. <laughs> I don't want mm -hmm. um, to. That's okay. I, 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 can, I can do but, further research, but. But I think probably there, there's a, le a lot less up and down compared to the Le Puy route. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, but as you get closer to the Pyrenees, uh, the foothills begin in earnest. And, and, and do you have a French book as my last a travel book, a Camino book? you have I, did you write I don't one? I'm hoping to actually for the same publisher that did the Camino Frances moon I'm hoping to do the Le Puy um, mm. with them, but we're we're still you know they're still you know thinking about well, tell them there's a need because there's very few <laughs> good travel books for for France French pilgrims yeah routes. yeah the Cicerone just came out with an update of theirs on the Le Puy route, um, but you're right, the Arles route, the, the, certainly the Vézelay and the, the Paris route, those are not, you, you really have to rely on the French guidebooks and, mm -hmm. well, and the Con Confraternity of St. James may have some good basic guidebooks for those too, but thank you, Susan, I, I will tell them. Yeah. yeah. They really you. want to write that. <laughs> good. Especially when a guidebook, you know, like the, the Camino de Santiago guidebook, where th there's a lot of cultural and folkloric and culinary information and historic information, as well as the practical. Mm -hmm. So anyway, somebody was just saying something. So I was going to say, BB, um, again, so much gratitude for all of these books, which you've gifted us. Um, I have a couple in front of me. One of my favorites is Cafe Oak. I don't have it here. We're going to put up your books on the website. Cafe Neanderthal is one, the Camino de Santiago that you were just talking about, the Way of the Wild Goose. I'm curious if you could tell us, I don't know if you can, what are you <laughs> up to these days? Is there something new that's calling you? I am. I'm working on a lot of different projects. Um, I'm in that place where I'm, I want to get a couple book proposals to my agent. Mm -hmm. Is this spring, you know, the Why of the Wild Goose came out and the second edition of my guidebook, which is this was a big year for you, wasn't it? Came out both actually in May, um, courtesy of pandemic. They were supposed to release, you know, a couple months apart. But so so that was just just getting them done and then doing the book promotion. 
took a lot, but now I'm, I'm at that place where I have some book projects and I'm, I'm working up book proposals, a couple especially that I want to get to my agent. And they're still too soon to talk about, but one of them, I really, I, it's going back into the folklore as mm. doing, writing the way of the wild goose, I realized there is a rich body of folklore in France and Spain and in the Camino lands of France and Spain that is original and still very vibrant and little known, you know, especially like to bring those forward and, and merge them with the, the, the culture and the people that I've learned them from. So I'm not sure if it's gonna be like a Sharon Blackie style, you know, work of fiction retelling stories, the deep folk stories, or if it's going to be another work of nonfiction. Um, and I'm working on something entirely different for me. It's a, a novel, a work of magical realism. The Camino mm -hmm. does feature in it. Uh, and I really can't talk about it because I don't even know how it ends yet. <laughs> but Esther would oh, know fun. about that because Esther's written a pretty cool book. Yeah, yes. pretty cool novel. Um, yeah, just thank you. Thank you for asking that. Uh, yeah. We want to share, I'm going to share my screen. Um, if you want to read more about BB's books, um, here they are on her website. We've mentioned The Way of the Wild Goose and her moon guide books. There's Cafe Oak, Cafe Neanderthal. The, this one sounds fabulous to me. I have to pick it up someday. The Spiritual Traveler Spain, Historic Walking Guides of Madrid. And um, I understand if anybody's wanting to support BB more, I understand that it's helpful for people to write reviews on Amazon or Goodreads. So that's something that we can do if we're called to support you. Thank you. That would be great. It really does make a difference. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, yes, Ronnie, they do also make great gifts <laughs> since we're in the holiday season. Yes. And, and Christine had a question as well in the chat. And I see um, Ellen as well, too. So Christine? Yeah, yeah Christine says, there, there is a St. Martin's Way in France and throughout Europe. And St. Martin is often seen with a goose. And goose is served on St. Martin's Eve. Does this goose also have any relation to the goose and the Camino? Yes. Yes. A, a complicated relationship because when I first learned that St. Martin was associated with the goose, it was in Oloron Sainte Marie on the that staging uh, town on the French side of the Pyrenees for the, the Aragon route that joins with the, the, the Arles route. And um, he, he's shown as sacrificing. And it's, it, it, it really actually, you know, because St. Martin is, he, he's the saint that we associate with the, the generosity. He cut his cloak in half, you know, that we and gave half his cloak to a fellow soldier who, who had mm -hmm. none. And so is this, is, he's, he's very much this image of, of kindness, compassion, and generosity. And um, the goose association is really gone in, goes, delved into deeply by a medievalist at the University of Grenoble in southeastern France, uh, Philippe Walter, who's written a book called Christian Mythology. And he goes into deeply into the, the symbolism and iconography of St. Martin. And he, he believes, um, and he kind of, he, he backed me up in my thinking that this sacrificing of the goose of a really popular Catholic saint by a really popular Catholic saint is the prior native matriarchal divine feminine being sacrificed to the rising foreign patriarchal masculine divine. And, um, but it's, it's also kind of a negotiation. It's like they're both still represented. Is you, you, it took a long time for, for Christianity to fully take hold and root in, in Europe, especially in the countryside, in the rural areas, for the fact that people still really needed to make those offerings to assure the health of you know, their, their, their sources of, of livelihood. 
and you know the, the forest and the field. Um, so so it was a negotiation. Let's represent both, and eventually, you know, we'll hear more about Saint Martin and far less about the goose. Except we're going to eat that goose. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> what is it, November eleventh? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and there's a lot more about it, and and it's really it's it's Philip Walter. He's the source of of really saying, wow, this is also something. And he does mention the bird bird footed goddess in this context. So um, really fascinating rabbit hole, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, Ellen, is your question or comment brief? We're coming to a close here. Yeah, I, I just have a couple of comments just briefly that, um, you know, I'm not sure I say this tongue in cheek. I'm not sure if my Camino friends are good influences or bad influences. I, every time I listen to a group of Camino pilgrims, I add to my wish book wish list on Amazon. So I'm just like, oh, one more. <laughs> just one more book and there's always room for one more book so i appreciate that i had, i'm not sure that i had heard of um your your uh book bb but so i appreciate that that and, um but when i do my training walks just locally i um uh, encounter geese at some of my public parks and sometimes those geese are nuisances and uh, trying to go around droppings and it's like ah uh, so i so this is a little bit of a okay maybe i need to change my perspective on observing what how i observe those things in nature that this is not necessarily a total bad thing so um so there's just a couple of comments so i appreciate the um, thank you the, Eileen. Yeah. Yeah, so. you know and and i would say you know your your mission now is to see what you were thinking about or what message that goose is offering you by the timing of it showing up <laughs> <laughs> yes that's great i love that's kind of a fun humorous note to end on here um let me put just one moment i want to put something in the chat here um if you um adam tell us about our next wisdom stories coming up in december and oh, yes. if you if you aren't on our mailing list yet you can um, find the information that you need here. And then BB, we're gonna go back to you for one more story. Yep, it's on December the 17th and just festivals along the way. So, so it's those sort of, I remember my last Camino walking into Burgos and there was a, a massive three day medieval festival in play. Um, completely, complete surprise. And it's bringing out the stories from those similar experiences. So if you've got a, church, a story of a festival on the way to do with the Camino, do please come along next month on December the 17th. That sounds like fun. Yeah. And um, Bibi, so as we close, uh, have you one last story you'd like to share with us? Or any final words of wisdom? Sure, I, I'm, I'm divided between two, but I feel like I've promised you a return to these. Oh, yes, you do. Yeah. And, and this was a real affirmation of the synchronicity of the Camino for, for years when I walked by the forge of Ayagi, which is just after Estella, and right before the wine fountain in Nevada on the Camino Frances, there, that, that forge, the gates were always closed. And I just thought, I really want to, meet this blacksmith who has a forage right here on the Camino, right before the wine fountain, you know, of Irache. I mean, just talk about a magical, you know, landscape. <laughs> and he was never there when I would, would walk out of Estella and towards Irache. Well, this, this uh, May and June, I was back on the Camino and his gates were thrown wide open and there he was. And I just, I was so excited to just see who this character was and meet him. And I was stopped first at the, at the just at the entrance because this is what I saw him selling, these little pendants. And you see the, you do see the goose footprint. Is that coming through? Oh, On the shell. I do. Yeah, isn't that cool? So he was selling these iron foraged pendants that he makes with the goose footprint. And I thought, oh, 
wow, I have to talk to this guy. I didn't know he made this kind of stuff. And so I went and was talking, asking him all about, you know, La Pata de la Oca, you know, and, 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 and he, he, he said, well, how do you know about the Pata de la Oca? And I said, well, I've been really paying attention to it for years and years and years. And it turned out that my book had just released the day before I walked past his forge. So I said, and, you know, I've written this book called The Way of the Wild Goose, and it's just about all this lore and connection and symbolism with the Camino and the goose. And he just, he suddenly kind of got a little stern and he said, sit, I want to hear what you have to say about this. It was like I was being tested. And I said, well, okay, so it's all this, you know, it's an initiatory path, it's an esoteric path, you have to look for the signs. It, it could be the lost feminine divine in the European tradition, you know, and, and all this sort of stuff. And he kind of sat there and he just kept his arms crossed and was listening and, and kept this very neutral face. And then when I finished, he said, do you have some time? I want to make you something. And he went and fired up the forge and put on his leather apron and pulled a piece of iron and put it into the, the, the hot coals and uh, slowly pounded out these goose feet for me. And he said, I made you two because you always need two to walk, keep walking. And he said, well done. And I just, yeah, could have died happy right then and there. <laughs> but it was, I was really nervous because what if I got it wrong <laughs> and the book's out <laughs> wow so and a blacksmith that's just it you know going back to the alchemy the, yeah. the idea of alchemy blacksmiths mm -hmm. are semi-divine characters in our own folklore traditions they because they turn things into magical things they can turn iron ore into a cauldron which is one of the most magical important things humans have ever created mm -hmm. and many other things but uh so yeah trust your walk in life you know and keep following the signs that's an, such an incredible story bb i'm really touched i have tears in my eyes and it though that's my those are my goosebumps when i cry it's like oh there's something so rich there and, and what I see is in this whole journey that you've given your gift to the world, like you've done this amazing journey, you've given the gift, you were being tested in that moment at the end of the hero's journey, we give our gift to the world and we don't know if it will be received or not. And what an audience to have to give that to, you know, to be tested, arms crossed, stern man, and he passed <laughs> and he gifted you that, like what, what a... What a reason, you know, what a beautiful way for your gift to be received. And I just celebrate you, the journey you've been on, all the gifts that you give us through your writing and your being. And thank you for being here today, BB. Thank you, Kathy and Adam and everyone. You all are gifts to this writer. A writer is nothing without amazing readers. So thank you very much. Thank you. Yes, thank you all for being here today. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, everyone. See you hopefully next month. One more time, BB, thank you so much. If anybody wants to unmute, wave goodbye. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Thank you, everybody. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's so yeah. glad to be happy. Love, love, love. <laughs> Bye, Kathy. That was interesting. <laughs> Boy, thank you, everyone, for being here. Mm.